Yeah, so I, I use this so I can, at certain point, if there's anything I can reference to, I can bring it up. That's good for <laughs> me, need... too. Then I can remember some of this stuff. <clears throat> yeah, all right. Um... All right, awesome. Let's let's. I we're recording there. We're recording okay. here. I think we're recording over there. Let me just double check. That. Yeah. Yes, we are. And um, ooh. And this is okay. <clears throat> All right, Daniel. We're recording now. Sounds so, good. So, how are you doing this morning? Doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing great. So today is this is going to be our Bomber Media podcast number ten. Mm -hmm. If that means anything, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and we're with Daniel Bowman, who's uh, he's uh, you're you're a scientist and UNC a student. Yeah, You've, I'm a doctoral candidate at UNC Department of Geological Sciences. And the reason I approached you was um, I saw an article in one of the major like uh, science media websites mm -hmm. on space near space sounds you've recorded. Mm -hmm. So. How about you introduce you, yourself a little bit? Tell us how this came about. Mm -hmm. I, so I, as I said, I'm a PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill, and um, I study uh, infrasound, which is sound that's below the audible range, about uh, maximum about 20 hertz. And um, originally, we were looking at infrasound produced by erupting volcanoes. And one of the problems with the way we record it is uh, we only record on their surface. Whereas sound goes outward in three dimensions, and depending on how the sound is produced, it may go in different directions in different ways. So probably uh, back in 2012 or 2013 when I started, I started wondering how I could get a microphone into the air above these sources to get the three-dimensional uh, uh, acoustic wave field. And I had signed up for a NASA email list, and one day... It said, uh, solicitations for payloads for the high altitude student platform. And I looked at it and I thought, this is the chance. Put microphones on this NASA balloon, go up into the stratosphere, see if we can hear anything, come back down, pull the data off. Um, spent most of 2013 as an anxious mess trying to get everything ready to go, um, you know, for the six hours where it really counted. And then when we picked up the data, you know, not only did it work, but it was full of a lot more than we ever expected to hear. Um, and that is kind of what led to this push of mine to really develop this technology. Um, now, now that we're in the 21st century, things are getting miniature, more miniature, lighter, less power draw, better power sources. You know, the, I think the time has really come to for a three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional acoustic networks. And that's right now my focus. So I think uh, the, the, the thing about the science article was that it, it mentioned it was like X, X file sounds from space. Right. And that was what really draw me in. I yeah. think I forgot for the first time, and I mentioned this to a friend. I was like, hey, man, uh, I, I reached out to this guy that recorded sounds in space. And the guy's like, wait, you can't <laughs> record sounds in space. And I'm like, that's right. <laughs> so yeah. I got excited about it beforehand. And then I started uh, getting a little bit into it. So it, it is near space. It's not all the way out there. So there's a little right. bit of atmosphere right. where the sound still can travel as vibrations in, in the atmosphere, right? Is that the thing? Yeah, that's correct. And the, the X-Files comments, actually, it's, it's probably the reason it went a little bit viral, um, ironically enough. And a startup I'm working with back in Oregon, he's build, they're called uh, Smith & Williamson. They're building these balloon control platforms. I one day I was you know sitting in the lab and I sped up the sound. I just curious like what does it sound like? And I brought in the audible range. And I thought oh that sounds pretty silly and put it up on SoundCloud and sent them an email and be like hey, you know this is what sound up there sounds like when you can actually hear it. Guy wrote back. He's like oh that's cool. It sounds like the X Files. <laughs> and I I've actually never even watched the X Files since I was 15. <laughs> And then I was talking to a reporter at a meeting, and I said, yeah, I don't, and I said, yeah, you know, it sounds kind of like the X-Files, because, like, that guy's comment was in <laughs> yeah. my mind. And she, she took it and wrote, eerie X-Files sounds eerie. recorded in space, and then from then on, I was just gone. But really, for me, it was just like, yeah, it sounds kind of weird. 
when you when you when you say she, it's the ifls uh, dot com girl. No, that, it was that's life science. Oh, life science. Yeah. Yeah. So a reporter for life science. And, oh, uh, so that was the, the one that broke the the publication. Life that, science ah, did it. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. And then you know she did a really diligent job in in explaining the science and every as I recall, most or everything on there was pretty much accurate okay you know she didn't make a claim that they were coming from outer space or or anything else which is of course absurd like you said what was a little bit anticlimactic for me was the last bit um uh and and i'll put this up for you here to see well i won't be able to see it if i Mm -hmm. put it up here but i'll read it first and i'll put it up there sure it's um it, and this is a comment about what you you recorded and i think mm-hmm. one of the 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 big image was and, and you mentioned it was so like intricate all the stuff you got but then they comment on what it was probably mm-hmm. uh from what was the sources and then this is a guess i think it's uh there were signals from a wind farm under the balloons flight path crash crashing ocean waves wind turbulence gravity waves clear air turbulence, turbulence and vibrations caused by the balloon cable. Mm-hmm. And this is, to my knowledge, uh, here it is. to my knowledge, this is guesses on what you guys recorded, right? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about this? So you were first just uh, impressed with what, with the fact that you got sounds and that there were more than you expected. You know, yeah. I mean, the goal for me personally was to have it work. To have it record something. Okay. Um, because this hadn't been done in 50 years. And let's go back a little bit and, and, and go back to this. The cool thing about this, uh, and as I've read about this, is that there's a, a NASA balloon that's up there just for students to come in and, and that's use That's amazing. It. It's so such an cool. opportunity. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, how hard is it to get in there? Um Like there I were a hundred applications and there no. was only three And that's people. the ridiculous thing. I mean... That this isn't better known. Uh, we actually, our payload wasn't full. There are open oh, wow. slots. Um, and part of that is because there's a little bit of attrition, like a student team will make a proposal and they'll start working on it and, you know, life happens and they drop out. But um, a lot of the payloads are engineering based. Okay. Um, and I think we had success because ours was pretty novel. Like they weren't, because there's kind of a community of people who do this and know about the ha- high altitude student platform. I'm going to call it HASP is the, you know, the okay. acronym for it. And we didn't, they never heard of us. we never heard of them. And we just came in out of left field with this crazy idea. And so, um, you know, we got a lot of success, a lot of support, a lot of help from them because, you know, like building a payloads for a near space balloon is not in our job description. Yeah. Th- that That's one of the things that amazed me. I mean, the scientist that's researching this thing, you, Daniel Bowman, also engineered and and designed whatever's going up there, right? Which is usually a bunch of people doing it uh-huh. together, and you're all by yourself doing this. Well, I mean, there's a group at Boise State University who built the microphones, okay. and they're very bulletproof. I mean, they're it's Jeff Johnson and his students, and, and you know, they're meant for volcanoes, so they can take a pretty big oh, beating. Wow. So, you know, I had that, and then... The data recorder we got from uh, actually Jeff Johnson's group used it. I liked it. It was light. You know, I could drop it in the water. It'd be fine. X, Y, and Z. I figured it could survive a, a pretty rough rough ride up in uh, near space. So it wasn't that I built the equipment. I had to assemble it and make it survive the environment I was going to put it in. And keep in mind, I'd, I think I had only soldered one or two wires in my life before <laughs> having to like build all wow. the, the the connectors and stuff. Which, you know, you know, you're like first year undergrad in electrical engineering could do this, but I'm not, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I had to learn it from scratch. And now you want to build the balloon yourself, so you don't have to rely on the NASA one. Is that the thing? Um, not necessarily. I think you know the the issue with the NASA flights is that. Well, having NASA handle the balloon flight is great because a lot of things can go wrong um, during flights, but they're not flexible and they're extremely expensive. I mean, I don't know how much this launch cost, but probably hundreds of thousands, oh, wow. if not a million dollars. I, I don't know for sure, but it's in that range. <clears throat> and plus, you can only launch out of a few places in the world where they have the facilities to launch sure. a 500 foot tall thing. So what we're trying to do now and what we're looking for funding to do is 
either use weather balloons, which you can buy, like I just bought them some a couple of weeks ago. Basically, anyone who wants to launch a GoPro into, into near space could buy a weather balloon and send it off. How, how high do they get? Uh, they can go up to, well, it depends. I mean, I think yeah, you know, the highest I've gone in my own is 90,000 feet, so around, around uh, 30,000, a little less than 30,000 meters. But really pushing it, you go to 120, 130. I know one guy got to 140 here. And in the how does that triangle. compare to NASA? Is it how much payload they can carry, or do they go higher, or what's the deal? Um, well, NASA lists, like, lifts, I forget how much we lifted, like 1,000 pounds up there. Wow. And then, you know, like the weather balloons that you fly as a hobbyist to be uh, so that you're not hit with a bunch of regulations have to be a maximum of 12 pounds distributed oh, between wow. two payloads. Okay. So That's several orders limitation. of magnitude difference in size. But what I want to do when I'm working with these guys, Smith and Williamson, to do and also my own work in constructing balloons is make something small, flexible. I can take it out to the field. I can fly it over an area of interest and bring it back down and, and collect the data. And NASA is great for prototyping and it's great for, um, you know, knowing that the system's going to work and having a whole team of people who are world-class experts, but they're not, you know, you can't just go to a volcano and launch the NASA balloon. You have to do it in a few places in the world. And that severely limits the science you're eventually going to be able to do because you can't target atmospheric conditions that you want to learn more about. Basically, they're going to launch and they're going to launch, and whatever's going on in the I atmosphere yeah, is what you're going to record. Yeah, yeah, you're limited to what where they're they're located to. And before we get back to 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 the to the mess to the what you found up there, mm-hmm. I'd like for you to like I, like I said. So I run this uh, bomber media thing that's, mm-hmm. and I just graduated my MBA. So I'm not really. I don't really understand how these, uh, how the science career goes by, or, or mm-hmm. how it works. So, um, what what I'm interested in, you 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 jump into this PhD thinking uh, this is a field of study that I'm interested in. You right. still don't know exactly what you want to be researching. Yeah. How do you go from I'm interested in geological? Mm-hmm. What is it? It's, I was interested in volcano geophysics. I was interested in seismology, so earthquakes. So how do you go from that and then you slowly work your way into the sounds and then when you do so and make it work, how do, from there, how does the media get involved? I'm interested just, mm-hmm. just to know like step by step, how does that process? I mean, I think... I undergrad. I I've wanted to study volcanoes since li- uh, like four or five years old. I grew up around scientists. My dad was a scientist, and he knew a bunch of volcanologists. And they'd always tell you know places they'd gone, things they'd seen. And I thought that's what I want to do. Um, and then in high school, I worked under a guy who's named Rick Astor, who studied volcanoes using earthquakes. So I learned about earthquakes, and then I kind of built that up. And I started to have a concept of a wave, whether it be earthquake or sound, which transmits information from a very dangerous place to a place where you can safely observe it. Um, and then when I entered PhD, you know, my, my advisor gave me a, a project. I worked on that and it was signal processing. Um, and then just a series of serendipitous events led to, you know, studying infrasound, then studying infrasound in the air, and then working with NASA, and then trying to think about, well, how can I do this on my own? Um, so it's really, you know, you have to be flexible, I guess, and, and ready to capitalize on opportunities. And I mean, I'm sure there's lots of opportunities that I didn't see that were there. You know, you just kind of pick what you can do, and you, you roll with it. Um, and the media seems to be involved when you know, you appear to have found something sensational and, um, you know, which is at odds with what I'm actually trying to do. I'm trying to learn more about the world or on the edge of knowledge. So I think most of my feeling is anxiety. Like, am I right? Am my calculations correct? What if I say this and it's wrong? You know, like, because we don't know. We're not engineers. We're not building a bridge based on how bridges were built before. Like Yeah, exactly. We are inventing. The we're tr- the, when we're doing our job correctly, we're on the edge of knowledge. So I think, um, and then the media comes in and 
in the same cases, like if I were to interview you, knowing nothing about the business world, <laughs> I'd ask you a lot of questions, and some of them you wouldn't even know like what to say back, you know. And and like when people would ask me, "Well, are you hearing sounds from alien planets?" It's like that was one never the intent, two <laughs> physically impossible, and three no, like that's that's because I said the word X Files in a meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, you know, it's interesting. It's, I really appreciate the chance to speak with people because I know like what inspires me growing up was reading like Discover Magazine and now reading Slashdot, Live Science and all these crazy things scientists were doing. And as I started to learn more about science, I began to see the twist that was put on it, the flashiness. But in the same time, you know, I'm, I'm funded through the National Science Foundation, which means everyone who pays taxes in America is paying for my work, my salary everything I've done in the last few years. So I have a responsibility to give back and I think, you know, represent my science appropriately um, and answer questions that I consider stupid because I ask lots of questions to people who know a lot more about other things than me that are really dumb. And, and it's just hard when you're that, like, yeah. it's hard to be in that position and keep that in mind that, like, yeah, like, I don't know about, you know how the like for example how the plumbing works in my house and so i asked the plumber a bunch of dumb exactly. questions and he comes over but and to that extent i think um and when i was reading this i'm i'm very um i think i i think a lot about stuff like this that's not in my field i think that goes yeah. against me i should have think like that about my mba stuff and things like that but when i th when i thought about this and i saw this and i um one of the things that came to mind is that this has got huge potential applications and i know that you as a scientist you go step by step uh, and you don't yeah. think about the long run because you're not there yet and that's mm -hmm. assuming a lot of things go right but i like i like to get into a little bit of this because i think that that, that there is that kind of, of of potential and where it comes from the way i see it is that some people and because we're humans we don't realize how awesome uh sound is in terms of fidelity as a sense um versus sight right it's just mm -hmm. as, as reliable the thing is we're better and our brains is, are better at capturing light than they right. are at sound however when we look at for example weather patterns and we look at there's this kind of cyclone formation we see that with satellites mm -hmm. and then we make a prediction that because of that that's mm -hmm. going to move on so if you've got a rec sound recorder up there, it's just kind of the same the way I see it. And you can tell me in a, in a second if this is totally wrong. You can kind of see with sound what's going out there. And then you can, if you can get enough patterns and understand them enough, you can start making predictions. However, okay. I don't know how accurate these predictions mm -hmm. would be. But if you could, would it would be awesome if you could tell us some about, about this potential that, that this technology has. I mean, you're, you're starting it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm years from now, something's going to happen. I'm taking a step. Um, you know, there's a lot of people behind me taking a step, and then there will be a lot of people after me carrying it. You know, it's, sure. I think it's not the lone scientist doing things. Um, I'm the thing is, there's actually a bunch of groups working on this problem. Um, I'm the first, I think, to get such sudden exposure, but you know, it's, you're going to see a lot of this coming. Um, it's not going to be just me. Um, but I think in terms of applications, so one of the things that is driving infrasound research at this time is actually making sure that people don't detonate nuclear weapons. Um, and one thing that I'm interested in is if we have recorders in the atmosphere, they can go places where we can't put recorders on the ground. For example, the middle of the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, you can have these balloons floating and listening. So there is currently an infrasound network listening for North Korea or anyone else who might try and sneakily detonate a nuclear bomb without anyone knowing. But there's still big gaps in their coverage. Um, now, I've, I think I heard some about this, that in the past, when we were recording something, I don't know what, we thought it was nuclear weapons being de being detonated, and at the end of the day, it was just something coming out from out of space, right? Yeah. So there's a reliability issue with this. There so is. you think there there is enough fidelity in those little sounds, infrasounds that you're getting, so that you can at one one day fine tune them to understand very clearly when, where things are happening that you're listening to and what mm -hmm. it is. I think so. I think 
you know, like you said, science goes in- incrementally. And the reason we don't try and make giant leaps is because, you know, we're human. It's very easy to make assumptions and believe things that we're looking for or are unfounded. And that's kind of what the peer review process does is, you know, I, I make some claim in a paper and then I have like 10 really brilliant people read it. And then, you know, if I'm wrong, they'll find it out and then they'll publish something. And then me and the nine other people read that, or I should say the 10 other people read that. And then we'll go back and it's kind of like a a tennis match, you know? So we're like, we're kind of building each other up. Um, So I think, you know, the sort of recording something and knowing exactly what it is, is never absolutely true in any science. But I think, yeah, we can make a lot of progress towards it, but it's going to be a long time. And for this particular publication, I showed you the, the, what I read that seemed interesting to me. Uh huh. So what you actually found, uh-huh. you were excited about actually recording something, and this uh-huh. is potentially what you actually recorded. That's right? right, and big emphasis on potentially. And I mean, one of the nice things about being a graduate student, particularly under my um, professor Jonathan Lee's, and through funding through NSF, is I'm allowed to take risks like this that, as a young professor, I would not because. Uh-huh of the possibility of recording nothing, of having it all go wrong. Um, so I was kind of in a u- and that year I was in a unique position to capitalize a very, and a very risky with potentially high payoff experiment. Um, and yeah, I mean, my philosophy was make it, make sure it works. There's nothing else that matters. Like we're going to hear something. We just need to make sure it works. And then we did find the complexity of the signals. And then we start going through the literature and and trying to understand what they are and realizing that there really is very little literature up there and that a lot of this seems to be pretty novel. Um, So about this, um, so can you tell us a little bit about, you you know, what, what different sounds are the mm -hmm. crashing ocean waves, what different sounds are... Uh, yeah. the actual cables and you you can see you can understand this from what you the data you gathered you can build up to it i think you know what the first flight did is raise a lot more questions than answers <laughs> and we you know we expect that anytime you go into a new environment that's going to happen and then i'm flying again this year we're applying for funding to do this on our own and that is going to be designing specific tasks to say okay is this you know wind turbulence or a wind farm, or is this ocean waves or clear air turbulence? Is this gravity waves breaking X, Y, and Z? Because now that we see the characteristics of the different signals, we can now develop further tasks to distinguish between them. Um, I think that uh, in the paper I'm working now, actually I was working on this morning to submit to a scientific journal, is going to be mainly observational. Um, We're going to suggest different causes. We're going to give supporting evidence for them, but we're not going to say, here is a wind farm located here, um, simply because, again, I, you know, I'm very wary of making up substantiated claims. I think what we do is, what I want to do now is lay the groundwork for future experiments, whether mine or other people's, to specifically look for these certain signatures now that we know what a balloon flight looks like in the infrasound regime. Um, so is is it that the 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 success or the most valuable information from what you did comes from the fact that uh, in terms of of and I don't mean it engineering but structurally it was able to happen. So this means if somebody else, let's say I want to be in the field or anybody wants, so now I can read your blueprints to how you uh, put this together, so I can do it again and it will record something. I think that's part of it. Um, methodologically, uh, what I did was not really terribly profound. I think what I did was show, and what I hope I've done is, is show that the sounds in the stratosphere are fundamentally different than the sounds on the ground. Ah, and that is something that I think if you had asked any infrasound scientist, they wouldn't necessarily be surprised by. And, you know, there's been discussions. I found PowerPoint presentations on Google. How would we do this? But the fact of the matter is no one actually went and did it since 1960. Um, so it's not like a revelation to say that the sound in the stratosphere is really different. But now we've got a handle on how different it is and some idea of why it might be different and how we might 
use this knowledge not only to understand the way the atmosphere works and how to design better infrasound uh, arrays, but how to bring our science into the third dimension and start and start using it as, as we do in the ocean where we can navigate up and down at will. So you can, you, you can get more sounds up there, uh, but there's less atmosphere. So I think the fidelity of the sound suffers, doesn't it? Or it am doesn't. I totally wrong? Really? That's the great thing. Even though there's like less particles per square inch or whatever. And so you get really high, through? much higher oh. than a balloon would ever be able to fly. Um, you know, Newton's laws say that um, force is conserved. So, you know, if I push on you, you exert an equal opposite push back on me. That's that's fundamental physics. Um, so what happens with sound is it's a pressure, which is force divided by area. Okay. So that means as that sound rises up through the atmosphere, the density drops, but the force remains the same. It never It never changes. So the individual molecules of air move much greater in the stratosphere than they do down at the surface but the force they exert on my detector is exactly the same which means that the the intensity of the sound in the stratosphere is the same as the intensity of the sound would be on the ground as it rises all the way up and so basically it's like it's kind of, the pre, the the force exerted by a sound wave is conserved until you get high enough up that that um, I think starts to break down in the thermosphere, although I'm not, not particularly sure. So if yet. we were up there, you and me up there at that, we could hear each other just as well as we're hearing each other down here? No, because we can't produce sound as well. Oh, because our voice box doesn't... Right. I, mean, I mean, first the, the, of all, we'd air, be dead right? in seconds, but, <laughs> yeah, uh, you right. know, <laughs> if, if, if there was some way that we could okay. produce sound, so... I thought because of the way I see it and I imagine it, I imagine that particles are closer together down here. Uh-huh. And as you go up, they get farther apart. And then when when sound basically is you disturbing or making one vibrate, and then that makes the other vibrate. Mm-hmm. So if you're high enough where the particles are enough separated, then one vibrates and doesn't get to the other one. That was my idea. I mean, I think, I think that's, you know, you're on the right lines, but you're much... You're talking much, much higher than the stratosphere. You're talking um, really high up. And to be honest, I um, that's not my field. I, I don't know how... I've done a little reading on how, you know, what happens when you get so little air that sound really breaks down. Um, but I, it's not so... So that's totally not relevant to you because at that distance... We're way distance. below it. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's why I brought this, this thing up. And it's basically a diagram of, 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 of what different parts of the atmosphere are called Mm -hmm. but basically you guys are still very much within the atmosphere right at 20 kilometers and you get to space like in a hundred kilometers or so right and i mean it's it's, there's no dividing line it's not like suddenly you're in space the Karman line at 100 kilometers is is simply if you're flying an airplane you would have to fly it faster than the speed you would orbit at the same altitude in order to keep lift Ah, I see. So it's 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 you know there's still air up there. It's you know very little. There's still air. Yeah. Like you can't fly a satellite in the Karman line because it'll fall out of the sky. Um, but in terms of the way we usually say space, which is the Karman line, we're you know at best a third of the way there. So the the, w- the way I see the way this, if we had if we were lucky, we'd get halfway. I think the highest balloon flight in history launched by the Japanese got up to fifty three kilometers. So oh wow, you know they with a giant balloon that was specifically designed barely got to the halfway in space so the way i see it is it's just basically recording sounds high enough where you don't get a lot of distractions yeah and and uh, one of them one of the advantages of balloons is they move at the same speed as the wind oh so you don't get we don't get any wind noise and one of the biggest problems with microphones on the ground is wind huh um you know if you go outside you can hear the wind blowing past your ears and it's much much worse when you have a very sensitive transducer um and i i can't remember where i read this i'm pretty sure i'm not making it up i think it was like 10 years ago i read an account of uh one of the first hot air balloon flights in america these guys are flying and they're caught in a really high wind like i don't know 50 60 miles an hour they're flying low and they can see the trees tossing and everything going on but it's absolutely silent in the balloon because they're moving at the speed of the wind so they don't hear the wind yeah and so that's 
fundamentally why I use balloons and what we're trying to do is, you know, the, the problems that you get on the Earth's surface are gone. When you're, when you're floating with the wind, far from the turbulence, far from the cars and commotions and what have you, you're just gliding along in the stratosphere, which is itself a very stable part of the atmosphere. Um, you have the ability to hear things. My hypothesis, you have the ability to hear things really well. Um, we, I still think that's true, although it's a lot noisier up there than I expected. Huh. Um, but again, I think it's one of those things where we're going to have to do a lot more flights till we really say, was this a normal day? Was it not? Um, and, and one of the things that really caught my eye was um, I was thinking about this as I as I read it. And I think you, you made a blog post where you actually send up a camera there. Mm -hmm. And since I deal a little bit more with cameras, I was interested because I thought about it. Wait a minute. This, this scientist, it's not just about the sound. That was the end result. Mm -hmm. But he was dealing with what mic to bring up there, uh, how to record sound. I mean, even today what I'm setting up, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how to record this interview, which is very like, uh, like standard. And there's a lot of examples out there. So it's not really hard, but you're not necessarily in the We media. Have no field. Idea. So yeah. you're trying to find out about all these other fields, just so that you can get close or, or, or more information on yours. Uh -huh. But I, th I think that that's what makes a good scientist, somebody that, that can go beyond that and can, can actually, uh, solve that kind of problem that might present limitations to other scientists. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I think it's really cool about making a podcast like this is that we can go a little bit more about mm -hmm. into about what makes it, what drives you, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of what the science is and a lot of what Uh, some of the findings that people have made in the past, especially like Einsteiners, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. are, are are guided and are, are and are very much explained by the people behind them, right? Mm -hmm. So, can can you tell us a little bit about? Do you enjoy that part? Do you hate it and are like, mm -hmm. oh, I I didn't realize that in order to get this kind of research, I was gonna go th have to go through all this technicalities, mm -hmm. or is that something you've always liked, or is that something that that you actually had before and you're like oh that's perfect this works great together yeah i think i think um my seismology <clears throat> professor told me um you don't have this job unless you actually ac absolutely love it because our salary could be two or three times higher if we weren't academics uh, if i had gotten my master's and gone into oil i could be making over three times what i'm making now and um you know like salaries that kind of blow my mind um <laughs> So you do this because you love it, because there's not any other payoff. Um, in terms of the, you know, developing things and worrying about all these problems, uh, I mean, my friends and I, and I think, like you said, it's a lot about how you grew up. Grew up in a small town in New Mexico, and we were bored, and we would build stuff. We built catapults. We built rockets. And then one day we started building candle-powered balloons. Huh. And I think for me... You know, we were 15 or 16. Our first flight went up 30 feet, went into a tree, and then lit someone's yard on fire. Um, kind of like that movie. There was a movie, yeah, right, Red's about this. October Sky. So, yeah. but but you say this, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm from Mexico originally, but this is not your average kids out there, right? No, we, <laughs> we well, you know, in, instead of, you know, instead of doing drugs and drinking alcohol, we were building things, um, cool. which... You know, it means we weren't very cool, but uh, <laughs> that's what we did. And I think when we started making these candle balloons and there's something about when you let it go and it just rises in the sky and you built it and it's flying. I think there's a very fundamental human like awe at, at, at making something fly. Um, and that for me was very appealing. So when I was between undergrad and grad school, I was working in industry I was supporting my wife and she went to grad school and I was bored because... It was engineering and I was doing really fun stuff. It was a totally different field, but I had all this kind of mental energy that I was used to applying to my random projects. And then I started building balloons again. Um, and that what I do now is I do this as my job. It's like being in a giant sandbox and I just uh -huh. get to do stuff. And, you know, that for me is perfect. 
so yeah, I, I, when when you <clears throat> when you said that, I remember watching this uh, YouTube footage of some people, and th these were just average individuals that took a GoPro up to w with a weather balloon. Yeah. Until a point where you kind of see black sky, and you kind of see, and and I don't think it's that much. But it's more because it's a fish eye lens, but kind of so see a curve. curvature. Yeah. Yeah. But, people use GoPros to say they see curvature of cheaters. That's what I got to say. <laughs> but, but still, uh, I I I've always had this thing like the Truman show that movie uh -huh. where I think where, where I like to know that I'm not there. Yeah, so yeah. I like to, to uh, that's, that's in my bucket list. I want to send the camera up there just to see that I can get footage of kind of space with so my can, own you stuff. You can believe it. Yeah. Well, that's how we felt when we <laughs> sent our first one up too. It's kind of like, Oh yeah, the sky really is black. There really <laughs> is curved. What do you know? You know? Um, and, and yeah, you know, the, the weather balloon and camera thing has been done thousands of times by like middle schoolers. Yeah. <laughs> People have launched rubber chickens. Someone launched a uh, natty ice up there. It's just like, I get annoyed. And every time my friends, they're like, look, someone sent, you know, I don't know what, like Pokemon up there. And I'm like, oh, great. Another crap, <laughs> another piece of junk in the stratosphere. But the fundamental thing is it doesn't matter how many people do it. It's still awesome. Yeah. When you get the camera back, you pick it up out of a field or something. And, and the by sky the way, is black. And it's just like mind blowing. Who cares how many people have done it before? <laughs> I want to do it. That, yeah. That's for sure. But how do you get it back? I mean, that's one of the things that's that the still trick. nobody tells you. But but trick. how much is it actually checking for wind patterns, and how much is it just? You have to have a tracker. Oh, you have a tracker. That's what oh, you yeah. have a GPS tracker, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you know it doesn't? It's not going to end up either at the top of a building. You don't. Private property. You don't. <laughs> wow. So how much? How how many times do you expect for something like this to happen and for you to have a hard time recovering? Or... It depends on your philosophy of launching. Okay. Um, for me, for better, for worse, I tend to push the limits. I tend to make um, on my own time, not, not when I'm doing research, but when I'm doing these flights and I'm trying to develop something that I might use for research or I'm launching my own flights on my own time where I'm not going to put a bunch of equipment at risk, I tend to really push the limits. And I say to myself, anything that goes on this balloon, I have to be willing to lose. lose. Um, and I think in the case of, that you're describing, if you wanted to put a, a GoPro on a weather balloon, you would just have to be okay with the possibility that it could be gone forever. Um, my, in my experience, most of the problems happen at launch. So the balloon is destroyed or fails to take off or X, Y, and Z. Um, but again, like if you were like, all I want to do is get pictures. I don't want to do any fancy stuff. I don't want to push the limits. Then, then, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we did that once and we got it back. Well, see, my friends did it and then lost it. I think cause the parachute failed. And then we spent like a year. I did all the flight modeling. My friend built like his, he and his girlfriend sewed the parachute on a ripstop island. Like we were super <laughs> paranoid. We got it back. I actually made wow. the parachute too big. It went really far. Um, and then it was like, okay, like, you know, we could do five or 10 more flights that are exact same. And, but you know, once you've done it, you start to think like, well, what can I do next? Yeah. And that's Definitely. where you get yourself into trouble. Um, <laughs> so I think in my research career and with the Haas project, I said, this must not fail. This failure is not an option. And so I was extremely careful and I didn't try and do anything fancy. It's like you plug it in, it turns on, it runs. You know, and that's so when I want to record infrasound in the stratosphere, at this point, since the technology really isn't mature, I don't want to take any risks and I want no fancy, no funny business. Now, when I'm flying my own, like developing that solar balloon I launched a week and a half ago, we, we had stuff on there. And I said to my friend, it was some of his equipment, some of mine, I was like, you know, we've waited for five months. We, the winds look pretty good. Well, we'll try it. But might not get it back you know and we almost didn't i mean it, it it almost landed in a cow pond and and uh it in fact it it fell apart in midair you know something that we didn't expect but that's that's what happens you know that's El the one from the blog post right yeah yeah <laughs> you know elon musk says we're going to be blowing up rockets so i figure if elon musk can say that well i can rip up a few balloons <laughs> um but mm. uh elon no, musk is afraid of e ai that's yeah crazy for me but but, you know, you have to separate, you have to understand what your goals are. And so if your goals are recording scientific data, you're very conservative. If your goals are, let me develop a platform that I can use to 
to record scientific data, then you say to yourself, we're going to push the limits with the expectation that things are going to go wrong, but the only way we fail is if we fail to learn from it. Yeah. So, like, okay, so the solar balloon, like, the payload fell off. Well, we looked at it, and it was like, okay, well, we attached it with black duct tape, which got hot and melted. Well, we're not going to do that next time. <laughs> now, I, I read that, but is it really just the color that's going to be the, the defining factor in this? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, no, there's very little air up there, so, and there's a lot of sun. So, you know, here on, on the Earth's surface, you heat up, and the, the air carries the heat away. And it's kind of like when you go into a pool, and, you know, you're instantly cooled down because the water... Might be the same temperature as the air, but it's so much denser that it removes the heat a lot yeah. faster. Okay. Same thing happens up there. Something's in the sun, it can't cool down. And so it just gets hotter and hotter. We're talking about like 150, 160, 170 degrees, duct tape melts, off you go. Yeah, yeah. but it melts because it, it's the black. It's, it, it's color it's it's black. It's white, it probably wouldn't have melted. Really? So that, that I, it's all for, for, the, for the layman like me, it's impressive how the color makes that much difference. Well, and I mean, I was under that misapprehension, too. And when I showed a picture of my payload to the NASA guys, and they're like, that's not going to work. It's going to get too hot. And it's kind of like, we're at 36 kilometers of the atmosphere. What do you mean it's going to get too hot? And they're like, look, temperature doesn't even mean anything. Like, it could be negative 20 Celsius up there. And just because it's in the sun, it's going to overheat. And then at night, opposite problem, you know, thing temperature drops like yeah a stone. i think that happens uh in places like everest and that kind of stuff right because this um, is twice as high yeah i know i know so, no. yeah. but even though you're up there when the sun hits yeah. people get really hot up there yeah so and i, and I know you like this kind of stuff because when i was looking at your youtube channel i saw you uh some videos from going into the volcanoes and that kind of yeah, stuff yeah. so is the fact so i'm trying to understand the science behind launching this thing at top uh-huh. of a volcano to get the sounds from the volcano is it just because of your motivation and your interest in volcanoes or is there some specific things you you're trying to get or you that you think are going to be different or more valuable from recording there mm-hmm. it's um i mean as as a volcanologist our intent is to understand the physics of volcanic eruptions which are complicated yeah um and you can use seismometers, and that's very well, um, you know, that's very well characterized. But one of the problems with seismic waves is the Earth is a complicated place, particularly on volcanoes. There's lava flows, there's ash, there's sand, there's all kinds of different things that tend to distro- distort and disrupt seismic waves. Well, n- in the close range, you know, five to ten kilometers, the atmosphere is pretty much the same in every direction. Okay. So if you get an acoustic wave the prevailing view is that well it's a pretty clear representation of what caused it it hasn't been screwed up by all the stuff it passed through in order to get to your receiver okay but the one thing that acoustic waves suffer from that seismic waves don't is a seismic network you can have instruments up here and the source down here and you get a 3d view of how the waves radiate out well an acoustic wave you have you know a flat plane or a cone and all your microphones are on that plane and then the sound radiates out, and you only get the sound that goes sideways. And the stuff that goes up is lost. So this is what they use to predict uh, volcano eruptions? Because so I know they yeah. have something in, uh, underground that, that, mm-hmm. that uh, is monitoring this kind of activity, right? Is that what you're saying, the, the acoustics? Er, er, seismics are generally used for prediction. Uh, this isn't terribly my area, so I'm going to give you general general understanding. Infrasound's good to know when something actually happened because that exactly. means it's, it's in the atmosphere. Um, but as a scientist, my focus is on pure knowledge. So my hope is that someone can take my work and use it to an- analyze hazards. But when I construct my experiments, it's not how am I going to use this to understand the hazards. It's going to be how do I understand the physics so I can then understand how this system works and and manifest the phenomena that it does yeah you're basically trying to get a picture of the volcano erupting Mm -hmm. but in sound terms right right and then somebody can use that to to understand you know we've got people who know the chemistry of the rocks we have the seismometer you know the seismometers out we have the ability to image the volcanic plume the gas and dust coming out you know sounds just another piece of the puzzle um but my 
driving um, conviction is that is a two-dimensional piece and what we could have is a three-dimensional piece and there are differences in the physics that can only be seen in the third dimension which means that you can solve certain problems by having microphones on the ground but certain other problems will be sure. forever beyond your reach and so my attempt is to say is it possible is it feasible is it worthwhile to have a three-dimensional array over there so that we capture the full wave field as a complement to the full wave of the seismic and the chemistry and the, all these other things to start you know to put like the color by numbers and just color in a few more numbers and um infrasound is not going to solve all the problems it's going to solve it's going to contribute to solving some it's going to solve some specific ones but you know there's hundreds of volcanologists and and all i want to do is is you know add add my brush strokes to the painting That's awesome yeah so now a lot of people out there especially in your field are are have these sorts of hypotheses in different fields i'm sure something changes with this kind of media uh attention is it better do you now get more credibility when you say ah, i I've, i'm also curious about this and people are like oh well that must be interesting is it help in any way public exposure does not help at all <laughs> no and that's a problem i think um because i think especially now it's a very competitive field and my product is publications in scientific journals and I don't get credit for talking to the media um, I don't get credit for writing blog posts of course. the only thing I really get credit for is having my name in a credible scientific journal and having people cite my articles that being said I don't think it's a bad thing and I don't think it's perceived as a bad thing I think it's difficult for us because we're not communications we're not trained to do that that's why you don't have scientists doing hazards and communicating with the public and hazards that's not our job um, there are people who it is their job and they're better at it and they should do it um, but on the other hand when I look back in my past and what made me want to do science it was again because not because I was you know eight years old reading nature it was because I was eight years old and someone came on an NPR and being like I did this and it was great or you know we landed on Mars and we found X Y and Z and um, and particularly being publicly funded I feel that I have an obligation to sure you know obviously it's really exciting that people like what you do I mean you, I feel like I've made it when I was in the sort of things I was reading as a kid even if it was just once um, so indirectly you have people finally seeing some results uh, on like you said their taxes <laughs> And you've also got more people interested in the field. So indirectly, there is a benefit. It's just not, it's not very a benefit particular to my career. for this career. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pragmatically, I could put on my proposal as well. We, we're obligated when we apply to the National Science Foundation to put something in for broader impacts, which is how our work is going to benefit society. And sure, I could, you know, I could go to stuff like and do podcasts or whatever simply to put that in. Um, and I will. <laughs> but that's not why I'm here. You know, like, I will use this as saying broader impacts is like, I'm going to continue to do this. I have done it before. But for me personally, I'm not, you know, just doing my time and broader impacts. So I can go back to the 20 people on the planet who actually care what I do. Yeah, I think this is also always a debate because uh, people like me that are not very uh, in tune with this field. Uh, we're, we're, we're very uh, uh, impacted by people like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Michio Kaku. I don't know if you've heard about this guy. This I guy's haven't. awesome, man. He makes he, – if you want to read something, if you're not uh, very uh, fluent in science, read Michio Kaku. That guy can explain like super string theory to uh -huh. me, which is yeah. saying a lot. And then if you want to listen to or hear somebody explain stuff, Neil deGrasse Tyson's awesome. Yeah, but I watched then again, his Cosmos series, actually. It was really cool. Yeah, especially that they brought it back up and it was in Fox and it was like, yeah. oh, that's awesome, yeah. right? That's huge. So, uh, but when I sometimes look into uh, blogs or, or you're seeing the comments, scientists will sometimes say, well, these guys don't do anything necessarily to, to, to uh, contribute to the science, actually. 
but uh, they might not be doing a lot of research or they might not be. But I think it's equally important, right? Because mm-hmm. you, like you said, um, uh, there's people who are understanding the facts and, and the world around us. And that's great. They can be in a lab somewhere and, 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 and crunching these numbers. But then you've got to have somebody that explains it to everybody else. And then you've also have to have people that, that, that figure it out. And in, in order to feed this, the science, mm-hmm. you have to have that motivator that might be someone like Neil deGrasse, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to have, I think, all of these people in the field, like, for sure. Yeah, and, I, and, and if I you have that. one that's kind of rounded off, it's even better, right? It is, but I think it's very hard. Yeah, of course. Um, it's because, a lot to ask, I think. I mean, I can speak for myself. And, you know, I'm an average guy. Um, I'm not a genius. Um, I'm just doing what I love to do. But all of my mental energy, and you can ask my wife, all of my mental energy is almost always focused on my research. Uh Like, I live and breathe it. And, you know, you're right. I look at Neil deGrasse Tyson and um, what's the name? Bill Nye and stuff like that. And, and, you know, you're right. Like, okay, what have you got? Or even Carl Sagan. Like, what have you guys contributed to the scientific field? But on the other hand, I don't think you can have that cake and eat it, too. I mean, you're either going to be a good public communicator and a lesser of a scientist or less, you know. it's Yeah, of course. It's Because you just don't have enough time. So I think what they do is extremely valuable. And I think there's an onus on us scientists to understand that we are funded by society and that we should not look at it as a burden to explain what we do. Um, but that's my own opinion. And no, that, and that's definitely true because then you've had, you, you would have a lot of people shying away from it if, if it was something that was expected, right? Yeah. Because uh, there's very talented individuals that have done a lot that probably couldn't explain it or talk about it a lot. And they don't need to. That's fine. Somebody can go in and understand their work and then talk about it. And that's great. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just find it uh, amazing that, that you can have all these. Uh, because I think having this separate uh, like uh, skills or abilities is is definitely something that, that, that brings change into the table. And I think with you is something really interesting. I, I, I mentioned to you that uh, when we talked on the phone before that it was really impressive to me that and and I say this very lightly. I mean, there's not the, the the stereotypical scientist is not somebody you you go into their YouTube and they're out in volcanoes doing trekking, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I think you bring a lot of into the table that way, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have this this, uh, and I think all scientists have to have it to a, to a certain extent. This 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 ability and adventurous spirit to say uh, we might lose it all but we there's some there's a lot to gain in this knowledge mm-hmm. and i think that comes from somewhere that's more adventurous like you said from that mm-hmm. kid building rockets mm-hmm. than from the science mind and i think that's great because that's what's well, i think though things. that you know the science mind is thought to be analytical and logical and dispassionate but the practice of science is the practice of rhetoric and as rhetoric by what I mean is that you have to use the ability to use your words to convince other people that you are right. So you can, and I think Newton suffered for this because he didn't do it and then got mad when someone claimed credit for inventing calculus. You can be the best scientist in the world, but you're not going to succeed as a scientist unless you can communicate to your scientific peers. It uses a totally different language (laughs) than to the public. But what I see, I do see science as a performance. And, um, you know, that might be because I went to a liberal arts school or whatever. But the truth is that we are practices of rhetoric. So understanding how persuasion works, how, um, how authority is constructed is very important in the practice of science. Because all we have is our, is our senses and our calculations. And in science, there's no way to prove conclusively that anything is true all we can do is prove that it's not true you know it's like i can drop a pen 99 times but there's no guarantee it's going to fall in the hundredth the law of gravity is not a law of god it's a law that we think works because it's consistent so um that's something i've never heard a scientist say and 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 it's not always terribly popular when i say but but it is true uh that's what i what i think thought when i was a kid i was like we we've observed these laws happen up until now this way 
Mm-hmm. And because of that consistency, we assume it's going to happen the same thing tomorrow. Right, but we no really guarantee. don't. But, but I mean, up until now, that's the best method that we've had to actually navigate this. Yeah, and the way I think of it is like, the truth is in a box. And I'm walking around trying to find the box. And I'm circling in on it. And that box is always in the circle. And I'm trying to make that circle smaller. So I'm not finding the truth. I'm finding all the regions in which the truth is not. Yeah. And that is fundamentally disquieting and not what the public wants scientists to say. They want to say, we know this to be true and X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think... But I think when you compare that to anything else, yeah. to w- w- what's the alternative? So guessing? Right. Or I think it's... it's miles beyond anything else that we could possibly do to, to to predict anything right yeah i agree and i mean i'm a scientist because it's really cool to be on the edge of knowledge and i mean the youtube videos of us on volcanoes and whatever we are having a good time but we're there for a reason and we're on the edge of knowledge we're trying to understand how it works and then also um because i believe in the method i don't like the method but it's the best one i know like i don't feel comfortable with the fact that I'm not finding the truth. I'm just disproving everything except for the truth. But it's the best I have. So if you, and, and I think you mentioned this before, you haven't been published um, this, in this a research, science journal. This research hasn't been. I have, other hasn't, res- I have other research that has been. Yeah. So this particular research hasn't been published. Uh, if it were, mm-hmm. What, what, what would you think uh, would be the research or the conclusions or, or what would you think you would be publishing? I'm, I'm just curious about that. Well, I have a draft right now, oh, so wow. I can tell cool. you. Um, it's going through the background of you know previous research, stating the problem that we were trying to solve, which is you know what, whether it is possible and, and if so, uh, what will we find? Discussing what we did find, uh, presenting different analytical methods to try and tease out different parts of the sound that, that we recorded up there. Discussing the sources, um, providing evidence for one idea over another, and then stating honestly the, um, the confidence to which we can assign each one. Uh, for example, the uh, ocean wave sound. You know, I, I think I can present a pretty good argument that I do see that. Um, there's a very characteristic signature, and we see something in the right place. So what I can say is we find a spectral peak consistent with the ocean microbarium. So I'm not saying we found the ocean microbarium. We're saying, you know, it's in the right place. That's the best scientists can do um, without, like, somehow tracing it all the way back, which maybe a future study could do even with my own data. And then, you know, the final thing will be, here's what needs to happen to bring this to the next level. And so it's kind of a narrative. Um, and then, you know, the, the next, that's my goal right now. Is I'm, so I'm deconstructing the, the data that you have mm-hmm. for the moment. Now, it, doesn't this kind of media attention uh, just uh, mo- incentivize, or not incentivize, but make it more make a, a bigger probability that somebody was going to want to peer review it no no at all wow yeah. so but but a peer review would be major right would be something really cool no it i mean it's the, our currency is publications that's my product as a scientist that's what i produce that's how my value is judged so i have let's see one four peer-reviewed articles in print that i've so done. What, what are they Sign- about by the way the first one is on uh, really small earthquakes in the in a flooded caldera of a volcano in Antarctica. Oh wow! The second is a um, a high resolution spectral analysis technique called the Hilbert Huang transform that I adapted to a new programming language. So it's kind of a methods. The third is using. A, Can you say that one? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, it's a it's a spectral analysis technique called the Hilbert Huang transform. Okay, what is that? It's um. Uh, it's, it's a strange beast. It's a way of understanding frequency to very high precision. So what kind fre- of frequency? Anything. Oh. So a varying signal has a frequency. And usually you have to wait for one full wave cycle to pass. Oh, okay. So but this, this one can do it at every single point on the wave. So this is more mathematics. It's mathematical. Than, uh, yeah. than, 
So well, it is of... computational in the sense that you know I I took the algorithm and I wrote a software program to implement it in a certain programming language that it hadn't been done before, and then I applied it to seismic data and presented the software package oh, and shown okay. as a way of like showing my community, look, there's this tool out here. Some of us have been using it, but it's pretty neat. Here's what you can do with it. Um, and then the third one was using uh, underground explosions to understand how volcanoes make sound. So you go ah, out and okay. blow up uh, blow up a pad of dirt and <laughs> see what the sound cool. looks like. And then I was trying to use that and trying to bridge the gap between the explosion phenomenology and volcano volcanic eruptions and looking for commonalities. Ah, and the fourth was a real-time anal- uh, code I wrote to get real-time weather predictions. Um, basically, the, there's... Using what kind of data? There's a, a system run by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration called NOMADS, and it it's what's used by you know Weather Underground and all the other websites. They don't exclusively use it, but they draw from it as well. Okay. And I made a pipeline that takes so that like a a user in the programming language that my my group uses can quickly get weather data, and that's what I use to determine when to fly my solar balloon. Oh, so I would just wow. watch. We watched for five months. But what is it? What is it exactly? So it takes this data and then it, it analyzes it automatically? It doesn't even really analyze it. It just, you know, I'm a gatekeeper. I built a gate. I built like a, a floodgate. And, you know, it was um, for people in the climate and weather forecasting science community, they all know how to use it. But like for, you know, infrasound geophysicists and <laughs> volcanologists, like we didn't even know it existed. So when I found this thing, I was like, this is really neat. Like, I can download temperature for the entire planet. Like, this is great. Oh, I see. And I was thinking, and then it was kind of like, well, this is such a pain for me to use. I'm going to build a tool to make it a lot easier. Yeah, so then you're not like Weather Chapel Hill. You can actually go into exact coordinates or whatever to get exact cool. So I wrote this code, (laughs) you know, not to analyze it specifically, not to, not to like, generate new conclusions but simply to you know type a few commands and then get the whole planet and like to me that blows my mind you know and and like or let me get the winds from here to the top of the stratosphere but don't you need a lot of like uh processing power no because they've already done all the crunching all you have Uh to do is get it it's just that you know there's so many scientists so many different fields we all use our own standards like I don't know what that guy over there is doing. <laughs> and so what, what the code I wrote does is simply open open a channel to take information that was over here and bring it over here. And that has been probably, uh, it's it's been used by a lot of people. I've been really happy. So you knew coding before? Yeah. You, wh- where from? Um, I got placed in a map. Uh, coding class in the scientific package called MATLAB oh, when I was okay. a freshman in college. Oh, wow. Um, but you took that farther one, than a lot of people. Well, probably. it was what I had to sign up for eight electives. Uh, okay. Because, they, you know, you're at the bottom of the heap, and yeah. so you can only get two of them. And I got introduction to the Hebrew Bible and MATLAB. Wow. And those were my two electives. <laughs> That's crazy. That's yeah. very contrasting. Yeah, I said I'd cover my bases. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, the, the other thing I wanted to get to is um, we, we've talked about, uh, I think, and, and I, this didn't go exactly as I planned because I thought for some reason the media publicity would be good in, in any way. And I think it might be because if you're doing this, if you're still putting balloons up there, if you mm-hmm. continue... And, and you do you use blog posts to communicate that mm-hmm. and that starts getting views I mean to at one point you can probably get uh, sponsorship for equipment right yeah I mean I or that kind of thing I mean I'm just yeah I think I think I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not like it's bad but the the currency that is valued in my community is you know publications and peer-reviewed journals as it should be because that means people who have the knowledge to say whether you're, you know, full of it or not are able to sure. distinguish it. So for me to say in a proposal to the National Science Foundation, I've published 10 blog posts and no peer-reviewed articles, they're not going to care. <laughs> of course. Now, if I've published 
X number of papers in 10 blog posts and someone else has published X number of papers and no blog posts and I can say, look at all the public outreach I'm doing, then I get, I get prioritized. Ah, I see. So, and you have to balance that to like, if I talk to the media all the time and wrote in my personal blog all the time, well, I would have no time to produce world-class research or whatever. Of course. So, um, you know, and that blog has been dormant for a long time. Well, I use it to post my weather forecasting code. I put updates on oh, that. Oh, cool. Um, which is kind of um, funny because, you know, my friend and I were were pretty funny guys. And uh, he came up with the name Bovine Aerospace as, as the blog name. And then I started to use it to promote this computer code. And now, like, I get people commenting on it who are, like, my peers. And it's like, oh, you know, I've got this kind of tongue-in-cheek name for the for the the thing and now now it's actually getting attention but uh (laughs) you know i I think there's i knew a scientist who drew like cartoons like you know cartoons that you see in the paper and stuff and you know i thought that was really cool so it's it's not like it's not bad but it's not what's valued what's valued is you know doing stuff that is demonstrably good science okay um even if it is wrong eventually you know you you make a reasoned and clear attempt to push the field forward and then we adjust it and then someone else pushes it and then I adjust her and then she adjusts me when I take her work and I build up Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, you know, it's cool when the rest of the world cares. Yeah, it's it's funny how... uh such so much of 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 what we see is collaborative uh i remember somebody very long time ago asking this famous question about if you were sent back through time and talked to like cavemen and what could you teach them right Mm -hmm. and i guess and i think more than what you can teach them because you you don't know everything right that's the kind of punchline of this whole thing it's that you can't really make anything that you can like you can't make an iPhone by yourself, right? No. You'd have to have this big enough like civilization or, or, or just mm-hmm. infrastructure mm-hmm. for that to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So you need a lot of people to actually make things happen. People think uh, individuals make the world go around, but well, it's... Well, and that's what I wanted to say about the house program. You know, this would have just been a pipe dream of mine if, if, this, if NASA hadn't said we're going to spend a lot of money every year to give undergrad and graduate student-led teams the ability to fly something on into the stratosphere because the rest of me was just too great. Like, I I would never have been able to build a balloon that went up, floated that altitude, and then come down unless I wanted to do my PhD dissertations on how to design a balloon. Yeah. And, oh, by the <laughs> way, we put a microphone on it. You know, so... And then I would never have been able to do, to do this experiment if Jeff Johnson hadn't spent 10 or 15 years perfecting this infrasound microphone that we use on volcanoes. Okay. I wouldn't have been able to do the experiment if my advisor wasn't such a cool advisor and, and believed in me. I wouldn't be able to do it if I didn't have my own source of funding. I wouldn't have been able to do it if I hadn't had the education. You know, it all comes down to that. I mean, there may be mathematical geniuses who can sit in a dark room and, and you know, create the theory of relativity. That's not how I work, and that's not how anyone I know works. Um, and it's, I guess, the only time that I get worried when I talk to non-scientists is that they will represent me as some sort of lone like, <laughs> guy who had this amazing idea without realizing that I'm just one of many people in a crowd, and we're all doing really cool stuff, and sometimes one of us says something like X-Files, and then it blows up, and, you know, to me, like, the the contribution to the scientific field I've done so far, this is still not yet a contribution because I sure. haven't published it. So my real bulk of my work that someone might hire me on the basis of is is on, you know, um, modeling volcanic explosions, which no one has so far cared about in the media, um, which is fine and the way it should be. And then if and when I publish this research – and people are able to read it and cite it, then it will matter. It's funny because people, I think we're limited a lot by our lifespan and or mm-hmm. of government official lifespans, uh, right? Because uh, not not their lifespans, but their their terms, right? Because mm-hmm. some of these people that, that, that determine funding sometimes do it to see results within their term or mm-hmm. within their lifetime. Yeah. And it's really hard because 
very few like awesome scientific discoveries are started and and finalized by the time it do in, in a lifetime right so you have to think a little bit beyond yourself and you're in this field and that's a big thing because even people like when i read this kind of thing and and if at some point the article says about us capitalizing on this on um, by 20 i don't know 60 and i'm like ah who cares i'm not gonna be here or whatever mm -hmm. so that's uh that's that, that that's i think a huge limitation right especially with a non-science public yeah i think i think it's easy to say well who cares and i think my answer to that and i've thought about this carefully because um you know i don't want to be a drain on society i think that science is like having a savings account and but every time you put in money to your savings account you also get a free lottery ticket so incrementally we're building technology we're coming up with new ways like this might make airplane safety easier because now we can detect turbulence or whatever it's little gradual improvements and then sometimes you win the lottery and and i'm talking about from the public's perspective and you get a scientist who invents something probably doesn't even know what he's done and it changes society in an <laughs> instant like penicillin you yeah. know like huh that's funny this mold is killing that bacteria and saved billions of lives you know, a scientist doing something who wasn't looking for antibiotics. Yeah, doing a lot of times it's different. accidental. Let's see. So when we fund science, we have to understand that we're, you know, we are making just the increase of knowledge alone adds an incremental benefit to society, even if it doesn't sound like the knowledge is relevant to, is relevant to anything. But every time you make that deposit in your bank, you're also getting a free lottery ticket. And the chances of any one project transforming society is very low. But if you play the lottery enough and you're getting it for free anyway, someday it's going to pay off. Really yeah, the more you do it, the better. So and, and this brings into the question, do you think we're focusing enough on it? <laughs> I we worry focus a lot on all the other stuff. I worry on the desire to impose... Um, other agendas on science, I think um, when you try to ask what is going to be the industrial benefit or um, how can we use this information to maintain our dominance over X or Y, because, you know, science works best is when it's independent. Um, there are, working in a corporation, I deeply value the focus that, or, that corporations can solve problems really fast. But they can't look beyond the payoff you know we solve this problem for our client and immediately we're hustling for other clients like we don't need to solve the reason behind the problem we just have to solve the problem that the client assigned us and when you give scientists you set them in an empty room and let them do things it's really frustrating because you don't see any like products coming out but then someone invents penicillin yeah and i don't think they would have invented penicillin like a company you know culturing bacteria to make oil for example and then mold gets in the bacteria and kills all of it they would have just chucked the whole batch you know they wouldn't have been able to instantly transform yeah. into a drug company right and that's you know you don't want a world full of scientists you don't want every other citizen to be a scientist but i think there's a strong value in having the privilege as a society of having a few people around scientists, social scientists, humanities people whose job it is, is to think about these problems because society will have a payoff. The problem is you can't pin it down. Yeah. I, I the first time I started to grasp this was one of my best friends from, from my, from high school. Um, uh, he went on to study a doctorate in math. Mm -hmm. And whenever I, I mean, I've always been business oriented, right? So there's a lot of applications to math, right. to, to sophisticated math, especially in banking and that sort of thing. And I was surprised he wasn't interested in them. And more surprised was that his field of, of research in math wasn't at all tied to anything practical right it was just math and more math and more proofs and so what is that i don't i didn't even know it was like if it's not for geometry or something what is math mm -hmm. well the funny thing is that when 
scientists and th this kind of people start developing theories on like super things or whatever, at one point they might look into this math and be like, oh, that's a great platform for us to use that in order to prove these theories. But you never knew that that was going to be connected, right? right? And you never know if it's, it will or if it's going to be connected with anything else. But you have to develop that kind of like infrastructure of math yeah. for for it to, to pave way for other stuff to happen. It's, it's, it's really hard to think about it that way, <clears throat> especially when you don't know if it's even going to render any results, right? It is. And, you know, when it, when it bothered me before, my advisor, I told him explicitly, and he said, well, I think of it as artists. Like, I bring you graduate students to the top of these volcanoes hoping one of you is Picasso. <laughs> you know, and, like, I don't own a Picasso. Um, but the fact that and you they live don't know benefits either. my life. Benefit so, society. It makes you see the world in a new way, even if it's not like you have him in your house or you study him or you know him, you know? And I think that's, for me, as remembering being a non-scientist and looking at science in other fields and I see the stuff they're doing, it makes me happy to know we're going to fly by P Pluto. I don't know what they're going to find there. I'm not going to work on it. But the fact that we're flying by Pluto makes my life, a be makes my life better. <laughs> and that, to me, makes what they're doing worth it. Yeah, that that's also goes into feed my curiosity when I'm like, why exactly? But but I still want to see what's there. Yeah, like, we still want to see what's well, there. If it's really there, what what's happening? And I think they just published some new stuff on how the moons behave erratically as opposed yeah, to how we, yeah. we thought. So that's that's interesting. Now, going into the more crazy stuff that us people that are not scientists, I'd love to touch some of these points with you. Because sure. I think you mentioned at some point that impossible to get any sorts of of sound uh signature in your recordings from 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 outer space right huh yeah yeah, yeah. go ahead man so uh, you said it was impossible that you were gonna get maybe some sound from outer space right i think that but, yeah go ahead but is there i know that when you go and back and analyze for this publication is there's going to be a small amount of signatures that you don't know where it come from, right? Yeah, but course. they're probably going to be more mundane stuff than. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's the argument. Uh, I think it was Feynman who said this, or maybe it was Sagan. I think it's Feynman who said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, of course, definitely. So that's what I mean when you know someone says, "Well, what if it's this?" It's like, well, sure, it could be, but probably not. I mean. You know, is it is it air conditioners on the ground or, you know, something from the moon? Well, probably air conditioners on the ground because we know they're there and they're at the same frequency and they're pretty loud. But you're also somewhere where sound's not usually recorded. So right. there's also a possibility you're getting stuff that that no no other recorders getting. And, and we say probably air conditioning. Yeah. Oh, okay. So... Yeah. So and and I think uh, people are always uh, curious about what these could be, mm -hmm. and 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 I know it, it, it's a long ways before anything like that. But you mentioned you're from New Mexico. I mean, you're from yeah. New Mexico, right? Yeah, is yeah. this where the that Taos place is actually? Yeah, from? yeah, the Taos. So I told you I heard about this, and I know you're gonna hate this part of the conversation, <laughs> it's but okay. but it's, it's, expected. it's it's really weird for me that this thing happens, uh -huh. right? So. And, 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 and you probably know more about it than I do, I right? mean, I've heard of it. I don't know. And there's a there's a phenomenon actually here on the East Coast called the Seneca Guns, which is the same, like, weird sounds that happen. But no one can really explain The Taos is, is kind of bigger. Well, I mean... Yeah, but, you know, like, there, there's things like that that go on where... where um, but you as a scientist think that there's more probability that this comes from somewhere that's more obvious or more uh, known then uh then it might be proof or at least evidence that there's something out uh, different going on on that we don't know i think and i'm going to be very careful here i think that in general the causes of things are not you know there it's not going to upend the world of physics for example um because the probability of something normal happening that we just don't understand yet versus the something of really strange happening that we don't know yet, you know, the, the, probability, is, the probability is really balanced towards the, 
it's something pretty common that you know maybe there's the geometry of the mountains are such i'm speculating here purely i don't i don't know much about this but you know some sort of resonance is set up and like wind blowing over the sangre de cristo mountains makes the pressure fluctuation in taos yeah you know that again i'm not saying that's what causes it but like that explanation would be a lot more satisfying to me than if there was something about taos new mexico that was so unique to the rest of the planet that this really outrageous physical phenomenon that we'd never seen a hint of before is creating this. But I think every time we go into a different type of, 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 of uh, source from, for watching things, and I think our, our very first one is sight. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That works. We, we get it. But you're creating pictures of, of stuff with sound, right? You're right. creating an idea or, 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 or a reflection of something uh, based on sound. And every time you go into a different uh, wave frequency or you, you sometimes or at least in the past you get new stuff that you didn't know was there sometimes exactly but we've done that already is that is well, that the thing we we already yeah. know what's in that frequency we know no we don't okay um i think you know that was one of the things that again we would write in our proposals and say in our conference uh conference talks and we'll say it in our paper is like we're going into a new environment there's going to be new stuff um the distinction I make is between new stuff that is within the realm of physical possibility and new stuff that is very unlikely to be within the realm of physical possibility in the sense that, like, if I'm seeing perturbations from the solar wind in my mysterious signal, that's understandable, or high-altitude lightning or the other odd phenomena. But, again, like, the probability that we're recording, for example, a signal from the moon where we have no under no... You know, it's very hard to understand how the moon would generate an acoustic signal that would travel through empty space and then hit the Earth's atmosphere. Not to say that there's not some way that yeah, something could happen, but the probability of of the the necessary steps in the chain of causality to result in something like that versus you know particles of solar wind hitting the atmosphere, which we already know they do, causing the signal. It's different than saying. Well, we already know what's going to be up there, and we're just going to go find it. It's like we're going to find mysterious new things, but they're going to be within, most likely within the realm or explainable by the science we currently have. Which I, when when researching, we're doing uh, some Google research, of course, for my end, uh, for this. I came with, I, I came up with, uh, there's there's stuff out there on sounds that planets and the sun make, but that's. Yeah. Sounds that are uh, disturbances on magnetic fields, is that the thing, right? Yeah. So that's not a real sound. It's just translated into the sound we listen to, right? You mean when you hear the recordings online? You've seen that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, any signal you can turn to sound. We listen to earthquakes yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like we, you know. No, but, but the sound I, I understand is, 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 like I said, it's, it's, it's particles moving around and then your, your, your ear mm -hmm. translates that. But and, and that makes sense for us because we, we, we know what kind of things make what kind of sounds. But then when you have I that's I it's it's beyond me how magnetic disturbances can be turned into sound. Well it's the sense that like And this is also not your field, right? It isn't, but in, in a fundamental sense, um, it's it's not it's it's a strange concept, but it's has a fairly simple basis is like light and sound are both you know varying quantities of in the sound case pressure and light in that electromagnetic field which means that using a computer i can take a series of numbers that are recorded from light and then play it back as a wave file and then have it be sound exactly um, and, no, and, and it's no conceptually no different but it is it useful it is i i think in general, in science, because it's easy to quantify and point to, you know, we tend to use visual representations or descriptions. Um, but the reason I turned the sound file that went semi-viral in the, in the science news is because I thought, well, maybe I'll hear something here that I'm not seeing. And I do. I, do. I'm able to perceive, you know, I can't, the sound that we record is too low frequency. So I brought it up into the audio range. And now I can hear details in it that I can't see by looking at the waveform, by like looking at the wiggles, as my advisor likes to say, or by looking at the spectrogram or the spectra, like because it's using a whole new dimension of my brain. 
So when we record a seismic signal and play it back, like particularly kind from volcanoes called volcanic tremor, we can hear details in it that, that are harder to see when we look at our figures. Um, and so in that sense, you know, yeah, the sound is the second best to sight in terms of, of using it to understand different phenomena, even if they were never sound in the first place. Did you see that somebody in YouTube, this is stupid, but somebody in YouTube mentioned about us a moment in two, in the minute, two second, 40 something, that it kind of sounds like alien speaking. Oh, I'm sure somebody. <laughs> they always do that, right? <laughs> but mean, it's probably something, but it's not that, but, but it's probably you know the oceans or something. Probably an airplane, actually. Oh, an airplane. Or, you know, air conditioners in Albuquerque. We hear those apparently. Oh, know? Wow. We think, again, we think, but have pretty strong evidence. So, yeah, well, the fact of the matter is, like, I could take a picture out the window and screw around with the color filter and, and make it look like something. an alien planet, make it look like it's on K-Pax or something. You know, <laughs> you see what you want to see. And <laughs> if you, and my blog actually got picked up by a bunch of UFO guys about a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. I got more hits in one day than I'd gotten ever before <laughs> since. It's really kind of depressing. But... Their whole worldview was different, and the the interpretations they made were different, and it just kind of came to the point where, you know, if you expect to hear alien speech, you're going to hear alien speech. And um, yeah, definitely. But I think it it, it all of us have that, we and do. you had it when you were building rockets out there. Except all of us keep it in check to the extent that if we don't hear anything or we don't see anything, we're like, okay, so we didn't see that, but we saw this. And I think these people want and have like, like you said with corporations that it's better to not have uh, an agenda or something. I think these people want to see stuff. So that kind of clouds their vision or their view. And well, that's why we want yeah. you not to be like that. Right. I mean, I think that, look, the sounds do sound strange. I'll be the first to admit it. The reason they sound strange is the speed at which I chose to play them back. Maybe if I played them back at 533 times instead of 100, it would sound like, you know, some... the beach, for all I know. <laughs> it's the fact, and I said this on, on NPR when I was interviewing, when they were interviewing me, and I mean, they always sound so disappointed, but it's like, look, the waves are the waves. And, you know, you can play a rap song and make it sound like the chipmunks. Does that mean that it is the chipmunks? Yeah, no. No. It's all, you know, like this was not perceived by your ear. This was perceived by the instruments in the stratosphere, which I then translated into a means for you to perceive it by sound. Nothing more, more or less awesome than that. But then tell me something about why you chose that speed and a little bit behind. So is it that like visible light, right? There's wavelengths, right? right. And there's ones that we can't see and there's ones that we can't, exactly. but it's light. So I'm assuming that in terms of sound, there's the same. There's exactly. uh, a speed or a range that we can hear and some that we can't. Exactly. But there's a whole range that we can, right? So it's like color correct. Mm -hmm. You chose one mm -hmm. to analyze this. Or probably, I don't know, you might have chose a few and listened to them to a few of them. But can you tell us why or how or what, what's the... Well, when I decided to turn it into sound, I was sitting in my lab. It was like 3 o'clock, probably on a Friday. And I was just like... I haven't done this before. Why don't we <laughs> make it and bring it into the audio range? So it was below the audio range, so I had to speed it up. Uh, I picked a factor of a thousand, played it back. Wow, I can hear stuff in there. It's kind of like crackling around and some whistling. Well, that's kind of cool. And then look at the spectrogram and, oh, yeah, I can see it in there and bring it to my lab meeting. Like, hey, check this out. And then, you know, we all listen to it a few times and discuss the sounds that it made. There was no, it, it was an afterthought. Uh, yeah, there's a spectrogram right there. So, it, but but this is this doesn't have any speed to it or anything, right? No, that's it's a visual just, representation of the tones of the frequencies in the in the sound over time. But 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 it but it can also be like if you shrink it up, like you said, mm -hmm. it's gonna be more like the beach because it's it's gonna sound it's gonna look all the same color. But if you spread it out, yep. the differences mm -hmm. and fluctuations are gonna be more yep. uh, like you can see them better, right? Yeah, I mean it's like. You know, as an analyst, you are trying to pick apart information. It's like, I think of it as you're like approaching a block of stone with your chisel and your hammer. And you want to break open the stone and you're picking the places and you're tapping here and you're tapping there. 
and then it cracks and you can see what's inside and then you kind of turn it around and then you tap here and you tap there so we're taking information that we can't perceive and we're breaking it down different techniques to, to bring it into perception and one of the ways that I chose to do is bring it into audio range and I think the flaw in the reasoning of those who claim to hear alien voices is not understanding that that everything they're hearing is the choice that we made in analysis and that the fact that it sounds to them in a certain way is not proof that that is the cause of it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I got, I got some strange emails from, from people. <laughs> let me put it that so, way. And it's always really kind of baffling to me. We've got like 15 minutes uh, and I want to get, get to two more things. Uh, one of them is, uh, favorite pieces of gear and i think i've, I've started doing this in, in some of the podcasts i think with you it's going to be kind of interesting because you've got two types of gear you've got the the commercial gear but you've also got stuff that's not commercial that's particularly developed so i'd like to hear some of the contrast of of because for example i know this camera is very 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 capable and even if i built it myself i probably would do similar stuff right. than that. So uh, I, I'd like to hear some of your favorite, like uh, commercial gear, and uh, or or your favorite if it's one, and also non-commercial, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I'd like to know you every every publication you've done up to now seems to be kind of well, except for the earthquake thing, uh, but they're not necessarily related. So right. what would be next? And what would you think? Uh, what, what would you think would be the next field or the next uh, particular topic you'd be interested in in, 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 in going after? And whichever you want to go for first. Um, regards to the topic, I mean, the next thing I want to publish is my high altitude research, uh, and then then what we're going to be doing is trying to do this on a, on a much more individualized, targeted level, where, for example. I want to catch a quarry blast or a mine explosion or a volcanic explosion in the air. Ooh, okay. That's that's kind of the next goal for me. And then also, you know, understanding how the sound up there changes from night to day, whether it's, you know, this could weather condition or that weather condition or, or what have you, and really explore the space we've opened. Um, it seems really hard to catch a volcanic explosion. There's some volcanoes that erupt quite often, like every oh, okay. 10 or 20 minutes. Yeah, you'd have to... That's what you'd have to do. Ah. And there's some that just make sound all the time. There's one uh, in Chile that makes really loud noise. And it's, again, you can't hear it, but, I mean, it goes like 50 kilometers on the ground, which means up in the sky it probably goes hundreds of kilometers. I know in Mexico we have one that's still active pretty close to Mexico City, which Popo is, Capital, yeah. yeah. And then there's the awesome one that's also on my bucket list, the uh, Orizaba. I want to climb that thing, oh, but it's Pico dormant. Orizaba, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's one of the, also the reasons what I want to climb. It's dormant, right? It's not going to blow on me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that, that's, yeah, be careful yeah. of the active ones. Don't. Yeah, um, <laughs> you, you, I'll leave those to you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so you want to go further in this? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's because it's really a new field. And the really exciting thing is there's a group at Jet Propulsion Laboratory who are looking to use microphones on balloons to scan the internal structure of the planet Venus, which means they are proposing to launch a spacecraft to Venus, drop balloons off, have them fly around and listen to sounds. And if I could be part of that team, I ah, mean, that'd be awesome. I'm sorry, man. It'd be like my <laughs> life would be made. Flying balloons on Venus, I mean, give me a break. Yeah. That 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 would be really cool. That's but kind of Can you map the internal structure of the Earth with that kind of, with sound? So it's like radar, is that the thing? Yeah, well you do it with earthquakes. Uh, earthquake waves pass through the earth and it's like it's like getting a CAT scan or CAT scanning the Earth. Uh, the problem with Venus is it's nine hundred degrees Celsius on the surface, you can't really drop a seismic instrument off. But you can hear the earthquakes. But it's more like the the babies thing, isn't it? Like the in, is it? Yeah, isn't exactly. it called it's an ultrasound. 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 Yeah. That's, so it's that's, more like that, right? Yeah, and that's the standard technique in geophysics. Is you know we do that on volcanoes, we do that on the Earth. That's to how we know out. that the Earth has a solid inner core. Is a woman named Inga found it by calculating how the waves pass through and determining there had to be something solid down there for this to happen. All oh, right. Yeah, you're so, right. Because sound waves go through stuff. 
different stuff at dif- in, in different, different ways. Yep. In different ways. Now, and we Venus- use what we know from Earth to understand what might be that thing that's causing that mm-hmm. signal back. Mm-hmm. But how reliable is that? Because... Or we know exactly how sound goes through every element in the periodic table and every kind of thing. So I mean, we'll we know exactly good what's... Guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, wow. there's, there's gaps, obviously. Um, but So what's that going to look like? A balloon, like the one in... What was it? Cassini that dropped and, and, and it was kind of a balloon. Is that... Um, Cassini was a lander. So this... Oh, was Actually, it? the Soviets flew a balloon in Venus in the 80s. No, I think in, in, in Jupiter there was one, right? I also, well, they dropped Galileo into Jupiter, but that just had a parachute. They didn't actually fly a balloon on there. So what's this going to look like? If it, uh, They're working on it. Ah, interesting. Um, hopefully I'll be working on it. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. So yeah. that's uh, what you think doing next. You're going to continue on this path. I would, I would love to cool. to be a part of that project. I think, I think what they're doing is innovative and spectacular and I think would yield some really incredible science, not only on this internal structure of Venus, but also how the atmosphere works. Um, we would we would get the sort of data set that just like makes what you have up there look like child's play. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so favorite piece of gear? I got to say, uh, there's this little computer called a Raspberry Pi. And it's what we flew on our solar balloon. And Raspberry Pi. It's called Raspberry Pi. P is spelled P-I in this case. And uh, we had it hooked up to a camera. And it's cheap, so we risked flying it on our solar balloon, and it's the one that took those videos from up in the stratosphere. Oh wow! And that, I mean, the fact that you so that's can commercially have, available. Right? It is. It's and it's also open source, so you know I you can it. program it and do stuff. Oh. And so my friend, my friend Xiao Yang, had, had bought one, and he bought the camera module, and he and I, over months, like spent time configuring it, testing it. I put it in my freezer. I did this and that. Oh, so you check. Until we were confident that it would survive the flight, we put it up there, and it did. And I mean, I'll always be grateful to them. And then the spot satellite tracker, which survived the 13 mile fall and told it told us where it was, cost a little bit of money, but that's how you get your balloon back. So those little babies so tell you where they all, are. All, both of those are commercially available, yeah. right? I see that. So that, that that raspberry thing, it looks like the casing <laughs> is optional on that yep. one. <laughs> so am I? Uh, it, did you build the one for yours or? No, I mean, we we bought the case in the computer and we just stuck in the Tupperware container with ah. all the rest of the flight <laughs> instrumentation and off cool. it went. Um, and then in terms of my favorite stuff that I've built, I mean, the solar balloon that I developed. That can be launched by two people and fly off to seventy-two thousand feet. Is that the one in the YouTube channel? Yeah, crazy. You know, I spent years trying to get one of those to fly, and then finally, you know, after a lot of iteration, we have a design. And I mean, that thing took off in fifteen minutes, and it made it way higher than it had any right to go. It's interesting because do you have to have something like this exposed to to pay to, My, to the, the air? microphone? Does yeah, and it's got to be. I mean, I know for this, I need to have. Uh, like a cover to to stop sound to stop uh, wind, which you say it's not a big deal, but yeah, the, the it's not easy. I no. imagine. <laughs> I mean, we we uh, built our payload thing for the solar balloon to supposedly survive a few weeks at sea in case it came down, but I don't know. I mean, the goal was to not have it land in water. We almost still we almost hit water. Wow. Um, you know, the things these things have to survive almost two orders of magnitude difference in density extreme sunlight extreme cold yeah really rough falls water trees animals it's like <laughs> it's such a crazy environment. people that might steal it as well or yeah. want a, a reward for giving it back to you well, actually what i did the first thing when i saw it land is i called the sheriff oh and really? i said first of all if anyone freaks out this is what this is you know, because I thought it had the whole balloon attached to it, so they would have seen this 19-foot streamer of yeah. plastic come ripping down out of the sky. And then I said, you know, help me. I know where it is. Can you help me get in contact with the landowners? Because, you know, you want to... You don't want the sheriff to, like, give you a call and be like, there's something... There's a box with your name on it sitting out in the field, and, like, it scared this guy, and he called us. Like, you want to sort of say, hey, yeah. like, I'm a UNC student. This, we flew this thing. It's down here. Let me know if you have any questions. Do you tell them in advance? Too? I didn't because I didn't know where I was going to go okay. specifically. Um, but you have to notify somebody, right? Nope. No one. It well, depends, what about depends the on the size of the payload. 
Oh. Um, if the payload's below a certain size, it's... Um, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's like... Because I know, like, drones can't fly up to a thousand, more than a thousand right. feet or something like that. But, but you... we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, but it's like having, you know, you can't drive a car without a driver's license, but if you run and do something, you're still liable for the damage. Like, yeah, of course. So, you know, if, if, if we made a bonehead decision and let it go over a city and, and it went down and caused property damage, we'd be liable. Or hit an airplane. Right, or hit an airplane. Which is not likely. No, and I mean, airplanes, the reason the regulations are written as they are is because airplanes are supposed to survive these sort of things. Oh, like, okay. You know, they can eat a Canada goose. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, a, a raspberry pie is, is not too big of a deal. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, anything else you want to cover? No, I just uh, really appreciate the chance to talk with you. No, I mean, it's awesome. I think uh, uh, the, 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 the actual thing that the democratization of this kind of, of equipment that it's now more available to actually make an HD video for, for that anybody has access yeah. to. I think it's, it, it, it's great that, that you do it so that people, whenever they want to information on certain stuff, there's, there's good quality stuff out there for them to, to, yeah, to, to and listen I mean, to. And I, and with the solar balloon stuff, I hope someone does it and does it better, you know, and like post a YouTube video up to a hundred thousand feet. And then I see that and I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to improve on that. Yeah. You know, like, the citizen scientist movement is really wonderful. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, awesome. Thanks for, for, for doing this podcast. I think it's uh, it's our, our biggest uh, guest so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks uh, a lot for having me. But but that's awesome, man. And I, I wish you a lot of luck going Thank forward you. with this stuff. And, and, and I think, yeah, you, by the way, by, by how you, you've been developing so far, I think there's no question you're eventually going to be uh, working alongside people that are going to be like kind of in, in the Venus thing or that kind I of stuff so. eventually. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thanks okay. a lot, man. Thanks. And let's stop the recording now. All right. Awesome, man.